Uh, I'm thrilled to be here uh, today. Uh, Dr. Will Miller is originally from New York City. That's where I was also born and raised. And is a health psychologist as well as hospital and police chaplain. He has worked in community mental health centers as well as in drug and alcohol rehabilitation programs. Uh, for 17 years, Will has had an active career as a professional stand-up comedian, headlining clubs and theaters across the country. Uh, he has made numerous television appearances and hosted the NBC daytime program, The Other Side. For many years, Dr. Will appeared on the Naked Night Network, as well as the Bob and Tom Show. He's been profiled on NBC's Dateline and in People magazine. He is, nationally recognized, he is a nationally recognized authority on stress, coping with change, and hosts a weekly podcast on health and wellness. Please welcome Dr. Will Miller. Thank you, Bill. Can we uh, begin by, uh, you know, it's really hard. Uh, I've been speaking at um, meetings for a very long time. Try and imagine hurting the cats to have all of this work well. Let's give a hand for all the people who put this together. <laughs> all right. I have to do something here. Hang on. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Here we are. You know, don't look at this. Don't look ahead at the slides. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> living well, letting life change you. All right, now let me see if this thing works. Yes. Are you feeling uh, floral today? Are you feeling uh, peaceful? And let's do ten minutes of meditation. What do you say? Let's just kind of. I don't know how you're coping. Can we get more wire here? No, I want this sucker. You got more wire? Get more wire. Give him a hand. Isn't he doing a fantastic job? Yes. We were just talking about the nightmare of someone in his position having to do something like this when some idiot speaker doesn't prepare properly. Um, I never use the word idiot. Okay. <laughs> you thought it. <laughs> All righty. Uh, my presentation uh, is, is directed toward, uh, I guess, people you serve and the condition they're in, you know, the soap opera of the people who you uh, deal with all the time. You have some complicated relationships? Yeah. But it's also for you, for you and me, about how we cope and deal with change in a world that is spinning our heads with change. And so maybe some of you are uh, people of monk-like quiescence. Uh, but if you're like most Americans, you're actually this guy. <laughs> you know, uh, I've been a therapist for a very long time, and uh, I really believe the laboratory for America's mood disorders is probably most clearly seen driving. Uh, and the reason is, is that the vast majority of you here are not um, um, sociopaths. Raise your hand if you've been diagnosed as sociopath. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. But you know what you are? Like me, you're neurotics. You're a neurotic. And uh, which means that a neurotic means that you can function appropriately within the boundaries that you decide, but then you look for ways to let off that steam, and driving is the way. You know, there are two styles of driving. See which one you fit into. One style is, and I'm like this. I'm an excellent driver. I really love to drive. Uh, I'm very alert when I drive. I uh, probably drive a little bit too fast. I get impatient with people around me who seem to be in a fog in their car, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a sort of a type A driver. I'm an assertive driver. Applaud if that describes you. How do you drive? Do you drive like that? Yes, okay. All right, now the other style is you're an excellent driver, but you don't get all that you know, wrapped up about the drama on the road. That's a waste of time. You use the time while you're driving to think about you know, a meeting you're going to, a conversation you're having. You're more of a mellow driver. Applaud if you're a mellow driver. Okay. Uh, just a point of order, the Mellow Drivers Group B, you are the people who are pretty much in the way of Group A. <laughs> On behalf of Group A, get out of the left lane. <laughs> Why are you there? Man, can you feel the rage I just uncorked here? We have no desire to rush you. I mean, you want to take uh, you know, several hours to drive a few hundred miles? I don't know, just take the blue highways, get off. Do the scenic route. Get out of our way. Uh, driving, actually, uh, I'm an advocate of having, uh, sometimes you get irritated in the road and uh, it kind of sneaks up on you. You ever have this happen? You're driving along 
and you're in a pretty good mood, but you look in your rearview mirror, and for some reason you don't know why, you just kind of don't like the attitude of the guy behind you. <laughs> right? Something about their face kind of gets under your skin. Maybe they're driving a little bit too intensely behind you. When that happens, what do you do? Slow down, that's right, yeah. Someone said put on the brakes. Uh, that could be what we call a self-defeating strategy, right? <laughs> well, that'll teach you to tailgate me. You know, you have $3,000 of rear-end damage to your car, but I think you taught him a very good lesson. <laughs> no, you slow down to irritate them, and then when they go to pass you, what do you do? Speed up. You all answer. Of course you do. Neurotics. <laughs> yeah. uh, see, I think the... I don't know wh where you live and how intense the driving is. In the era of texting, every driving environment has become an urban driving environment because you have distracted drivers. And uh, see, I'm an advocate of having two cars. One car you love and nurture, take certain places, and then have what I call a rage displacement mobile. Do you know what that is? <laughs> it's very liberating to have a car where you don't care what happens to your car, right? When I was working in New York City at the drug clinic, uh, I was driving around this old bomb Chevy, and uh, somebody hit my car. So what? I didn't even have to stop. Somebody hit my car, just, you know, whatever. It's like, who cares? These mirrors are for grooming purposes only. <laughs> it's got to be a big car, though, because now the, the, the new thing is kind of little dinky cars. You know, like, have you seen the smart car? Yeah. Oh, my word. It must be kind of fun to drive in a car where you can lean casually out of the passenger window. Some guy, my neighbor, had one, and, and uh, he, he was trying to, he was saying to me how great it was, and he goes, uh, man, it was so cheap. He says, I got all the options in it. I said, oh, so it's a loaded smart car, you know. I said, what'd you get? He goes, you know, a stereo with front and rear speakers. It's like an indoor iPod. I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> said it had a rear view defogger. Why? This isn't real tough to do. <laughs> oh, man. See, uh, you know your car's getting old when, if someone wants to borrow your car, first of all, you don't mind, right? I mean, you're kind of surprised they ask permission. Um, hey, Will, can I borrow your car? <laughs> yeah. What, what, are you going to do something to it? Why? Uh, then you have to give them about 10 minutes of pre-flight instructions on all the wacky stuff that's going to happen to them in there. Look, you can borrow the car, but i got to tell you, when you step on the brake, pretty much you're going to be making a left turn. <laughs> you slow down, you'll actually change lanes. And the floorboard's kind of rotted out, so keep your feet on the pedals at all times. <laughs> My mother lost a shoe last week. <laughs> I borrowed this guy's car one time, and he said to me, now look, when you get in the car, the seat is stuck all the way back. I said, all right, I'll stretch. He goes, no, that's not it. He said, about 10 minutes into the ride, the seat's going to kind of pop forward on you. <laughs> so I'm on a highway in, in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm just waiting for the seat to come forward. It was worse than what he said. It's not like it went from a rear position to a forward position. It broke loose and never hooked back on to another location. <laughs> I was swinging back and forth. Think about what I look like if you saw me driving by. What's that guy doing in his car over there? It's like he's kind of floating around in it. <laughs> oh, maybe he's got a Nordic track seat in there. Well, I don't know how you uh, are with your mood. Uh, let me see if my little device here works your mood, and I don't know how much you take it out, but the fact of the matter is, is that a high percentage of us do one of two things, and this is shrink talk. When you get frustrated, you hopefully find constructive outlets for it to resolve problems, but very often we do one of two things. We divert it into something else, or we eat it. Right? We repress it. I mean, that's just basic psych. You know that, because you watch Oprah. All right, this is me. I'm a psychotherapist, uh, sociologist, whatever. Spent 20 years as a stand-up. I've had pretty interesting career clashes. In 1990, for example, I was working on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where I'm from, and I was uh, working at a crack cocaine clinic and working with uh, uh, people with, with psychotic disorders and were addicted to crack cocaine. And then at night, I was doing stand-up at uh, Catch a Rising Star, The Improv, and you know, I worked with um, many people who went on to become you know, famous stars, and here I am with you. Um, <laughs> But I, I got, the comics used to say, you must get great material from your day job. But they were very, very different. I kept them very compartmentalized. I've been on stage uh, and had the pager, maybe the old pager days, vibrate on my belt. And that meant that after my stand-up set at the comic strip, I had to hustle off to Roosevelt Hospital, where I was working as an on-call emergency room chaplain. If only the people in crisis knew where their sweating chaplain had just come from. I finished my gig. I'm here for you.
my favorite story about my career is Glushing had to be when I was in seminary uh, in, at Columbia University, and, and uh, I was taking the introductory course in the Bible, and I had very little background in this um, because I was raised Catholic. Any Catholics here? Yeah, we, we, we didn't know the Bible. <laughs> and so, um, so I, I, was learning the, I was learning the Bible, you know, uh, as I went along. And, um, and so the final exam on the uh, Hebrew, the Old Testament, was really intense. And I said to my wife and kids, I have to, I have to get up by myself and cram for this exam. It's going to be really tough. She goes, well, just call Tony your agent <laughs> and have yourself booked on the road. All right. So I got booked on the road during this Bible study week uh, to open for Aretha Franklin. I was her opening act at the Tropicana Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. So I went down <laughs> to the Tropicana to open for her at night in the showroom and study for my Bible exam in the day. <laughs> In my room, I uh, had like two big beds. One bed I slept in, the other bed I had about 10 or 15 books that you can imagine all about the Bible. The woman cleaning my room was giving me these really kind of scary looks and I said, what's wrong? She goes, uh, you know, I've seen every system for gambling there is here, but that's really quite unique. <laughs> <laughs> she thought I was using some bizarre biblical technique to, to gamble. Do you know what I became an expert in without uh, uh, intending to? I became an expert in popular culture. I mean, if you think about that, we're all, you know popular culture. You know more about it than you like to think you do. Uh, even you know, when I was on Nick at Night, it was a classic TV, popular culture, and then the fact that I had an academic background, that's kind of what enabled me to talk about this stuff. Um, remember that show, The Jetsons? What was the father's name on that show? George. Meet George Jetson, Jane, his daughter, his boy. What was the dog's name? How did he speak? Listen to yourselves. <laughs> Professionals on the cutting edge of your profession can actually speak like Astro the dog on command. All right, with the same facile memory, rattle off the names of the nine members of the United States Supreme Court. Go. No, you have to pool your resources. We don't know about that stuff, right? And so really what I want to talk about today is the influence of the world we're living in on our capacity to cope. Let's see what the next slide is. How are you doing? Look at that. You know, the headline, the headline, you know, therapists no longer, we don't, we don't really talk um, very much about or focus on stress. We talk about coping with stress because that's where the rubber meets the road, right? I mean, stress. Uh, this is my nephew, Brian. He's stressed. Uh, uh, and I had, a, boy, I had a really cool slide that was on fire that said stress and it didn't show. Uh, we lead the world in stress-related disorders, 25%. 25% of us have a diagnosable stress-related disorder, psychological disorder. So it's one out of four, so look around. <laughs> you know, if the three people sitting next to you look okay, you know, it's, <laughs> it's you. You've heard a lot of stress talks, and so you know what I'm talking about. But there's some things about uh, stress that you may not know, uh, and that is that how you cope with stress, as I said, you know, Julian Rada from uh, Indiana University was a famous psychologist there, and he's the one who came up with this idea that, that the two different ways in which people respond and try and cope with stress, one is to be a blunter and one is to be a monitor. A blunter is someone who, when they get stressed, prefers to, like, <laughs> shut stuff out. This is the guy on the plane who, when you're going through a storm, you know, puts eye shades on, headphones on, shuts the shade, and just, you know, doesn't want to... A monitor is someone who copes with stress by wanting to know what's going on. Think about attending, going to your physician or something. You all know people who, it's frustrating, they're a blunter, they don't want to go to the doctor even though they're getting symptomatic. I mean, you, you deal with that in, in your life, right? Or a monitor, you know, uh, that you're, you're always paying attention. The problem with, with that is, uh, uh, first of all, is the difference between acute and chronic stress. Um, Acute stress, the human body has amazing capacity to cope with acute stress. I work with the police, and you can imagine police or EMTs, when there's an adrenaline rush of a call and it's high octane and their whole system elevates and jacks up, and they are for minutes or even half an hour or something just a top fuel. When the crisis is over and they return to stasis, to equilibrium, the human body has marvelous capacity to have no lingering damage to that. That's not what damages us. It's chronic stress. That's, that's the killer. You know who this guy is? Look at that guy. Uh, do you know who he is? He's, he's a, this is a, a professor at Stanford University, Robert Sapolsky, who did the original... Uh, research on chronic and uh, acute stress. 
that actually your physician and healthcare professional now rely on, talking about the difference. And the way he did it was, he was at Stanford and he decided, you know what, I have to figure out a way to prove my thesis that chronic stress is what really corrodes and erodes your physical body. You know, it, that it affects your blood. You think about that, how it affects your blood. And so all you out here, I mean, if we all had uh, blood tests, we have a whole variety of healthy blood and less healthy blood, uh, oftentimes exacerbated by uh, chronic stress. And he decided to do it by going to Kenya, and he thought, well, I can't study it in humans, but what if we looked at uh, a community of primates, and he chose baboons for a couple of reasons. Uh, baboons, this community of baboons, and by the way, do you know what they call a community or a tribe of baboons in the academic literature? Congress. I am not kidding. It's called a Congress, a Congress of Baboons. Huh. <laughs> but their physiology had enough uh, familiarity to us. Also, they are, they're not predators, they're vegetarian, and they have a very social environment, and they have a strong alpha uh, community, whether it's the alpha males are on top, and then those who are dominated go down all the way down to the females. Okay, so it's a highly stratified alpha community. All right, and so his thesis was, first of all, when you see, um, when you see a baboon, I always wish they were wearing slacks. <laughs> They're very hard to look at, aren't they? Uh, and so the alpha community, he said, well, his thesis was people on the top of the food chain, people on the, on the, on the, the people in charge would have the lowest stress, chronic stress, the healthiest blood, and the ones down the food chain would have more health problems because their blood would be less healthy because they're dominated, right? And this was replicated, sure enough he found it out, and it was replicated in the Whitehall study with human beings, and so that today, flash forward, that's the little lecture that says why your blood causes you to have everything from cholesterol issues to heart stuff. I speak to a lot of corporations about wellness, and a lot of the motivation for wellness, stopping smoking, health you know, uh, initiatives, et cetera, is to cope with the chronic stress because it's this gnawing, that's the killer. And uh, now, as I said, you're, um, you're neurotics like me, and uh, the issue really is control. Isn't it control? I mean, how much control do you actually have? How dominated are you? I know many of you, just by the term extension, are out on some level of periphery from the core of the bureaucracy of the institutions. And so there you are doing your thing, having to manage your way to smooth it out with what you're allowed to do, what you envision doing, and how you get it done, all right? And so it's all about control. We are control freaks to the max. I'm a control freak. Um, I am reminded that personal control is an unrealistic expectation in certain life situations. For me, it's when I fly. Now, I fly a lot. I fly 100 to 150,000 miles a year, and it's ugly travel. It's like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Florida, California, whatever. It's not international. And after 30 years of flying, I'm still a nervous flyer. A plaudiff like me, even if you do fly, you feel uncomfortable and don't like to fly. A Fess up, seriously. Yeah. yeah, you're shy. You're afraid to admit it. You're looking around to see if anyone else is going to humiliate you about that. Oh, it's Mr. Scared Flyer. So, okay. Now applaud if you're one of those lucky souls who has no fear at all of flying, you like to fly. <laughs> okay, a couple of you applauded uh, twice. That's a whole other mental health issue. We won't get into that right now. Actually, the second group, the people uh, who have no fear, you're in complete denial, of course. You know. <laughs> Most of you are probably like me. If it's a clear day, I'm fine, I'll get up there. But um, you ever been on a flight and you hear a noise or you feel a sensation that you don't recognize as part of the routine of the flight? I don't want to just begin screaming like a child. <laughs> but you get alert, right? It's like, <laughs> you look up to see if anyone else is panicking, all right? If the frequent flyer next to you has not dropped their Wall Street Journal, you're probably okay. I look for the flight attendants. Do you do that? Because they know what all the routines are. Of course, the last thing you want to see when you look up is the flight attendant making that same face back at you. That would be really bad, right? <laughs> They go run into the telephone, you're probably going down. <laughs> and that's my fear. My fear isn't noise or movement, it's crashing because they've never really solved that problem, have they? <laughs> what do they have? They have seat belts <laughs> of fairly dubious value in a 400 mile an hour nosedive into the hillside. <laughs> wow, that was some impact, huh? Thank God for the old belt. 
Did you see that guy across the aisle? He had no seatbelt on. He went through the windshield. That's what actually kills you. <laughs> they have the oxygen mask. I've got to tell you, folks, if there's a crisis on board the plane, I don't want to become even more alert. <laughs> Wouldn't some kind of a drug or anesthesia be more merciful there? Uh, folks, it's Captain Bob. It's going to get a little dicey up here. You just take a big suck into that mask. We're going to knock you out for about 20 minutes. <laughs> we'll be up here in the cockpit praying to God we all wake up. <laughs> uh, I've been in some pretty frightening airline events. I was uh, performing in a club in Raleigh, North Carolina one time. And uh, uh, woohoo, Raleigh, great city. So we're coming in to land at the Raleigh-Durham uh, Airport. And um, this is a true story. So uh, the landing gear of the plane came down, but apparently a little light did not come on in the cockpit. So they weren't 100% sure the wheels were you know, down. Apparently, there's no little door they can look out. So <laughs> you know, it seemed to me they could have done something like with a mirror on a stick out the window, right? <laughs> oh, they're fine. It's no problem. So the pilot comes on, and I'm guessing he's new, because he actually said, folks, we're pretty sure the wheels are OK. <laughs> That's what he said. He goes, well, we're going to have to fly low over the airport and have the tower look at the landing gear. Apparently, this is not a su super uncommon experience. So that means we're going to, like, you know, buzz the airport, <laughs> slow down to, like, you know, 200 miles an hour. Some knucklehead's going to look out the window, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure two of them wheels were down pretty good. <laughs> I feel good enough about it. Bring it in. <laughs> I've been in uh, near misses. I was in a, uh, an aborted landing. You may have had that experience, but usually that's pretty benign, like air traffic thing. I was in one in Detroit, coming into Detroit, and we were just about to touch down, and then like a rocket took off. We said, what's going on? We thought, well, maybe they went to the wrong airport. What did we know? <laughs> you know. Oh, this is Toledo. My bad. My bad. <laughs> so the, so uh, the pilot comes on in that eerily calm pilot's voice, and he goes, uh, uh, folks, it seems like a truck went right across the runway in front of us. We're going to have to go around just try that again. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, as a mental health professional, that's exactly the emotional reaction of a crazy person. <laughs> he had no adrenaline at all. I was more worried about him then. I'm going to go around and see if I can't hit that guy this time. <laughs> because let me tell you, nobody cuts off Captain Bob. Nobody. See, here's what they ought to do. They ought to, like, they, ha they have no fix for the crash. I mean, you know, there's bumping and all that stuff. But if you go down, you, you know, that's it. And I'm scared of that because I'm rational. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but see, here's what they ought to do. They ought to give you about uh, 300 feet of rope with a hook on it. If the plane's going down, you should be allowed by law to, like, hook your rope onto the door, lower yourself out, hang underneath the plane, and ride it in. <laughs> What's going to be, like, any more terrifying out there than it is inside the plane in the crash position? No, but see, here are the physics. See, here's the plane coming in to crash. Help, help, crashing. But here you are down here in your rope, right? <laughs> the wind would keep you behind the plane. Now, before the plane hits the ground and your feet reach the ground, just start running and let go, right? <laughs> A couple of you are actually thinking this out, aren't you? <laughs> I was performing <laughs> in a club in Brooklyn, Bill. Uh, Pips, every comic you've ever heard of worked at Pips. And uh, this guy came up to me, classic Brooklyn guy, and uh, he says, hey, you know that plane thing you was talking about? It seems to me when your feet reach the ground, you'd be running forward at like, I don't know, two or 300 miles an hour. <laughs> Before you could stop yourself, you'd probably just run into the flame and wreckage anyway. <laughs> it's not going to work is what I'm telling you. <laughs> I said, well, you could wear roller skates and then veer off, right? What about that? <laughs> You know, what a neuro you know what neurosis is? Here's a handy way to, to uh, deconstruct that word. It's the inability to keep your thoughts in the present moment. Think about that. When you talk about letting life change you and coping with change, it's about what we do is our mind either runs forward anticipating with anxiety or you're ruminating about what happened in your past. It's sort of psych 101, but it is key. It's key. And so now there's a reason why uh, we have some personal techniques that are, in fact, are emerging. I was kidding about meditation. Meditation or psychotherapy or medication. I mean, I'm not cynical about that. I mean, you know, I have a lot of my patients who use the medications. Well, what's the medication to do? If you're anxious and you can't kind of keep your mind calm or you're ruminating, you can't keep it in the present moment, what does that do? It works in your brain chemistry to calm your brain down, to be centered, right? To what end? To give you the capacity to get out and re-engage your life. 
By the way, as we'll see, it presumes you have a life to re-engage. <laughs> right? Okay. So uh, let me just uh, take, you know, there's a lot of stuff. I deal with trauma quite a lot, okay? Uh, PTSD, et cetera. I think, you know, trauma is just the Greek word for wound. And oftentimes we hear trauma in conversation or in the media, we think about the big trauma. And, and that relates to many of you. You've had, you know, there, everyone here has had some form of signature headline trauma, okay? Whether it's to you personally, someone in your family, whatever. But think about it as just sort of the low level of wound, okay? Uh, well, what am I doing here? My, my slides aren't coming up. This is very upsetting to me. Yeah, what's going on? Oh, there it is, because this thing, wouldn't it be great if I like hurled it out the window and just smashed the window? Uh, post-traumatic stress. Everyone who has a trauma has post-traumatic stress, PTS. Not everyone gets the disorder. There's a big pushback in my field that not everyone has the disorder. The reason it's so uh, common with, with uh, um, soldiers, and I know many of you are working with veterans, is think about this in a very sort of simple way. When your trauma, your acute trauma, is in an environment thousands of miles away in a battlefield situation that bears no resemblance whatsoever to life in your community, and when they come back, it is very, very difficult to process that out Okay, and so that's the reason why uh, there's not a lot of empathy. Well, my first work was working with um, heroin addicts who were Vietnam veterans suffering PTSD in New York, and and uh, and the method that came about was compassion and empathic conversation uh, about it. But here's here's the skinny. The new field is now called post-traumatic growth, and it talks about what you do with the wounds and the difficulties that you've had. So if you think personally about yourself and what uh, wounds or challenges, let's talk about it in more you know, uh, e easier terms, ha have challenged you, what are you doing to use it? My wife Sally, for example, we've been married for 34 years. Uh, she was married very young and um, her husband was in college and they had two little kids. She hadn't gone to college yet and uh, he got cancer and died in like two weeks, just like, Boom, out of the blue. So she was left with no education and a four-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old. And so, you know, obviously that severe trauma, and there was some PTSD that she would report, but over time she came around to realize that she had a special insight to work compassionately with people who are grieving. And she's had a long, wonderful career. She's an elementary school principal, but she's had a lot of media exposure and, and writes about, about grief, you know, post-traumatic growth putting it into action, taking action uh, for what you're dealing with, okay? I'm not using this thing anymore. Man, that thing was bad. All right. <laughs> here's, here's where we get to the punchline. Um, there are two humongous changes that have occurred in United States, in American society, American culture, over the past six decades. The staggering rates at which we move and the tsunami of media and technology, right? Uh, and I'm guilty, this is my family. <laughs> uh, I come from an allegedly functional family. Um, I'm one of eight kids from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we lost a brother young as a baby, and then seven of us grew up, and uh, working class family. Um, and um, we all went to college, uh, paid my undergraduate loans off a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> and all seven of us did what Americans have been doing for years, I'll bet you can relate to this, we met our significant other, and we went off to do our life. And today, the seven kids in the family live in seven different states. Right? That may be more extreme than you. My parents lived in an eighth New York until they began a late life trend of stalking us. <laughs> they realized we weren't coming home. They moved like six times after the age of 60, following one of my sisters or brothers around. Right? Again, that may be more extreme than you, but you know what I'm talking about. You know that the communities you work in, the universities you're attached to, I mean, what happens? That's, that's the way of the world today, right? Let's say you raise a son or a daughter and uh, you're really lucky, you're blessed, they, they're just doing great, okay? And so your daughter, say, uh, goes to your own local university, goes to University of, uh, you know, Maryland or whatever. And, yay! And, and while there, they meet the love of their life from Seattle. And so then they get married. The only time you'll meet the clan, the tribe, that spawned this thing <laughs> is at the wedding reception. And then they disappear. And then your kids negotiate the two places, and they live in a third place. And all are, 
that's America, right? You know that if you're not this profile, that all of your extended families around, you know that you are a rarity, and increasingly a rarity, all right? I mean, we move, constant mobility. 40 million Americans move every year. During the recession years, it dips a little bit, but you are surrounded now by people of influx and outflux, right? Strangers all the time, all around you. Between 20 and 40, one out of three move uh, every year, one, they'll move every three years. Uh, we move every five years, okay? Uh, and so if you think about that, and just do like a little profile for yourself, again, maybe you're the exception, maybe you're living and working where you were born and raised, but how many of your core relationships that were established long ago. Now listen, I'm a therapist and I'm not naive. Some of you may be thinking, yes, I, I don't live, live anywhere near my, my family. Thank God. <laughs> but whether you were, you know, ran for your life out of a rotten family or were fired like a rocket out of a great family, the bottom line is, is that we, we up and we move and we settle down and that's America and it's common. And we have terribly underestimated the psychological impact, the psychosocial impact of that so sociological trend, okay? Uh, and then, of course, media. Um, this is my daughter. No, it's not. It's not, no. Um, you know that. You know that, that we are still in the midst of trying to absorb the technology and the media. The average American, I think this next slide has it, right? Yeah, 28 hours a week of just television is the average in America, and that's not internet time. At internet time, and now your smartphone. Has anyone gotten the iPhone 6 or you know, have one of those big phones? What's, I mean, the iPhone 8, what, what is that? It's gonna be like a helmet? <laughs> I really believe, personally, that in, in 30 years, the average person will be wearing a full media helmet. You'll get up in the morning, you'll dress, and you put on your helmet, and everything will be media. You with me? No. <laughs> I don't, I'm kidding, I was kidding. I mean, you know, I don't really, <laughs> I'm not psychotic, I don't really actually believe that, but. We, we are drenched in media. We're looking at screens. When, we, when uh, Glenn and I, my co-author, and I uh, do corporation uh, workshops, we'll ask them to poll them, how many hours a week are you looking at a screen? Television time, computer screen time, et cetera. It is a minimum of 20 to 25 hours, sometimes as much as 50 and 60 hours that you are engaged with a screen. Now think about that just on its own. Every hour you're looking at a screen is an hour you're not looking at a face. We are awash in our love of media. The new TVs that are curved, I mean, how much do you hunger for the next upgrade? Can you identify, what is that? Do you know what that is, what is that? Flat screen TV, right? You ever, you ever driving uh, in your area or some, some city or something and you see, you notice some guy who's just set up shop and he's selling something on the roadside, probably without a permit, you know, like he's selling like Picassos you know what I'm talking about? Out of his trunk, you know what I mean, whatever. Uh, so these were guys who were selling these um, and they were charging I think about $500 and people were like, oh my God, I'm getting a flat screen TV. This is back you know, when it was like $2,000, getting flat screen TV. Uh, actually when you opened it up, it's an oven door. They were going into vacant apartments, taking the oven door, packaging them like, like a flat screen TV and selling them and of course, Idiots, you know, because by the time you went back to get your refund, the fellow had gone to your city, you know. <laughs> we are just in love with our technology, okay? <laughs> now here's the big question. Is that a great picture or what? Here's the big, big question. Isn't it true that you have conversations, worry, and ruminate about what is this doing to us? You can notice things. What are the things you notice? Well, five teenagers sitting around, uh, you know, and, and at at a table, and they're looking at screens. They're looking at their phone. They're not looking at each other at all, all right? I mean, you know that. This is just kind of, this is just like the snapshot of America today. And so some of this research, this research is in the middle of unfolding right now. You really can't say anything very certain. There's some speculation. We'll talk about that in a minute. Conversation is reduced, eye contact's reduced, and satisfaction with uh, conversation is reduced. There's a fellow, uh, he just, uh, um, from Stanford, I think his name is Nash, and he was the one who's done the studies on uh, multitasking. Now, if you talk to <coughs> people across the ages, we all multitask, but there is, and I know you work with young people a lot, and there is, um, let's say, a confidence, if not a condescending arrogance, 
with the young people that, well, we can multitask. I know many of you who are of an older age can't do this as well as I'm a much more facile multitasker than you. So at Stanford, he, he, uh, he found graduate students who were self-professed and even tested according to their own diagnosis that they were expert multitaskers. Brought them into a lab situation. <laughs> they suck at it. <laughs> they're terrible at it. Do you know what they're great at? Switching. That's what we're becoming good at, switching. A facile multitasker is a facile switcher. The screen to your face. That screen to my screen to your face. That's all it is. But the depth of engagement in each of those shrinks down and is minimized, OK? Consequently, depth of thinking. There are a lot of professors, for example, who are saying, you know, I've had it, no computers, no technology in my classroom. I want you to attend to me and the material. And it sounds like kind of a geezer old school thing, but in fact, it's picking up on this research, OK? Uh, so again, once again, just like moving, how many hours of TV do you watch? You know, what, are, what, are, what is your screen time? How many text messages? Your family, what's your family life like? You know, again, this is an unfolding story. You know, um, the guy I work with, uh, Professor Glenn Sparks at Purdue, is a world-renowned media expert. And he was the guy who uh, introduced me years ago to uh, the work of uh, Marshall McLuhan, <laughs> who is very prophetic about this stuff. And McLuhan basically pointed out, as a, as a uh, social historian, that there really have been two gigantic changes in the way we communicate in human history. It was oral communication for millennia. And then, you know, a millennia ago or less than that, we switched to illiteracy, to reading. And he says, we are now in the third evolution and that is electronic, where we're going to be leaving the literacy, the reading, and moving all to electronic. And his contention was it takes about two or three centuries to fully adapt and to have that settle down. And we're only one century in to the electronic age. So when you talk about coping with change, you do one of two things. You either fight this, or you figure out how to make it function and work for you within the context of where you are. Being exasperated and frustrated uh, with keeping up with this is completely understandable and stressful, but it's only going one way. It ain't going back, okay? Uh, how do you let life change you? Well, it's basically through other. See, here's, here's the thing. When you talk about moving and technology, it's altered uh, our life experience at a daily level. All right, now you don't know me, and I don't know you. Suppose my wife and I came to visit you at your home, and we're sitting at your kitchen table, and we're having a really pleasant you know, conversation, just uh, you know, you're telling me about your family, I'm telling you about ours, whatever, it's really nice. And imagine if about uh, five minutes into this conversation, without asking, I get up, I walk to your refrigerator, uh, I open it up and I start looking around in there, really looking around, like I make a salad. Well, you might not say anything out loud, but you know that's not how visitors behave. You'd tell people later, I didn't know this bozo. Uh, he went into the refrigerator, took out last night's dinner, put him in the microwave. Then he went into the den and took a nap. <laughs> that's not how strangers behave. All right, let's change the scenario. My wife and I come to visit you at your house, and we've never met before. But it turns out the reason for our visit is that we are related. We're kin. We're blood kin. I'm part of the wing of the family that moved to the other coast a generation ago, and we're having this reunion. Well, even though my move to the refrigerator would still be a little abrupt, it would be a notch less shocking for us to assume that as kin, you want me to feel at home in your home. It's not based on interpersonal compatibility. It's an act of will, all right? Using that litmus test, uh, think about your daily life. Think about the people you see and encounter every single day. I'm not talking about people you can email, text, get on a plane to visit. I'm talking about the mugs you look at every day. All right? You have a couple of people in your house, you have coworkers, you have neighbors, whatever. Let's say the 20 or 25 people who you see with the most regularity. How many of them have refrigerator rights in your house? How many of them, if you go to their house, do you wait to be invited? Or can you just go into their refrigerator? How many of these people see you in your bathrobe? Uh, hear you talk the way your kids hear you talk? Uh, how many of these people can go into your medicine cabinet without raising an eyebrow? You know what I'm talking about. Refrigerator rights, relationships. That, I'm telling you, based on all of the research, is the smoking gun behind 
our struggle to cope with chronic stress because we cope with stress through others. It's about having a family life of brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and nieces and nephews. Today, kids get out of college. What is the decade with the most uh, adjustment issues right now, other than the elderly with health issues? 20-year-olds, 20 20-somethings, 20 right out of college. Why? Well, it makes sense. You go from the soap opera of high school, and you ran for your life out of that. And then you go to college, and with some exceptions, it's like, ah, free at last. And you get connected to these people. You eat with them. You go to class with them. You, they become solid. I'm, I'm looking into faces of people I know, even if you haven't laid eyes on your uh, classmates for many, many years. You know them, and you're tight. And then all of a sudden, in four years, after all of that bonding and connection, and it's not interpersonal compatibility. That's a myth of pop psychology. You don't get close to people. I mean, aren't you related to people who you'd have to say, oh my god, if I wasn't related to you, I'd have nothing to do with you. <laughs> Faces are coming into your mind right now. <laughs> Hope it's not your spouse. <laughs> See, that's why marriage, I think this is the, you know, moving in media, the loss of refrigerator rights, I think is actually what's going on with marriages too. I've been a shrink a long time and a, and a, and a minister for a long time, and so I'll, I, when couples come to me for marital counseling, they're not there for a tune-up. You know, they're ready to kill each other, right? All right, we'll go to a counselor. And so they all tell the same story. Uh, well, of course, because I asked them this, well, it was great when we started. You know, I mean, we fell in love. It was wonderful. I believe this was a good choice for me. Uh, no one once ever came in and said, no, it pretty much uh, sucked right out of the gate. <laughs> and then what happened? Well, no, it was great in the beginning, but then after three years or five years, I realized I had inadvertently married Satan. Sometimes they had, but in a high percentage of cases, there were two good people who ground each other into powder. Guess what their lifestyle was? They had disconnected from their family of origin, you know, proximity, moved to some third place. The women didn't have any women who were like sisters. The men didn't have men who were like brothers. Sometimes the men tried to find a sister. <laughs> women tried to find a brother. You know what I'm talking about, right? They didn't have anything. 1943, a study on the East Coast. Now, granted, it's a little anomalous because it's in the middle of the war, but it was typical. 80% uh, of married couples grew up within 20 blocks of each other. Think about that. Think about that at a level of lifestyle. So if my daughter met your son, even if the families didn't know each other, you knew of each other. You're probably compatible socioeconomically in terms of values, et cetera. Even if there was a, this horrible divide for grandma and grandpa across religious boundaries or some other such, but nonetheless, you knew what the families were like. Oh yeah, it's a great family. Yeah, their aunt, you know, their aunt Mary's completely crackers, but they know that our Uncle Paul is off his beam. Uh, so, but it's a good family. And then that couple stayed there, had their kids there, and got absorbed into two gigantic families. Now when I do a wedding, it's almost comical. Well, it's not comical, it's pathetic, actually. You know, they have the bride side and the groom side, and then you go out, you know, you kind of merge together. They'll never see each other anymore. I mean, th then they go their separate way and it's over. You can't function as a human being at an organic level alone. You can't do it with self-reliance. It's a myth of the culture of, you know, be an army of one. Pfft. Hey, let me tell you something. I was in the army. Oh, I didn't tell that story. Uh, 1971, uh, they had the draft lottery. Some of you may be the age of that. I was number one. <laughs> I won the lottery. I graduated from college on a Friday. Monday, I was in a truck. And uh, my mother, my cruel, cruel mother, sent me my yearbook when I was in basic training. And she says, so, Mr. Commitment, look at page 47. Open it up and there was a picture of me with a peace sign on and long hair going, you know, like that. And there I was with a shaved head and basic training. But I grew up in an extended family. Matter of fact, my father, um, I grew up in a disciplined family. When I was uh, in basic training, I called home uh, and uh, my father, who had a big World War II experience, he goes, how are you doing with your drill sergeant? And I just retorted, I said, this guy's nothing compared to mom. Nothing. I was disciplined by my parents, I was disciplined by my grandparents, my aunts and the uncles, and I know that there's a, there, there's a sense, there's a sense that this is just sort of the lament of a previous generation of what's wrong with the next generation, but I'm telling you, at a ground level of psychology and health, we are not designed to function disconnected from an array of relationships. What happens? The kids graduate from a university and they, they, 
They go maybe even with a couple of friends and they gravitate toward a really cool city to go to, right? I mean, anything from, you know, and it's not always only the big cities like Chicago and LA and New York. It's increasingly like Boise and Birmingham and play Indianapolis, whatever. And they go and they immediately set out to get connected to their age peers. And that's what they do. All the pubs are packed uh, after work hours with people getting to know each other, getting to know, because you're, 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 you're looking for that particular relationship. What reaction would you get? You say, well, you know, in addition to that, that's good. You really need someone who's five years older, 20 years older, 30 years older, five years younger, 10 years younger. You have to replicate the family that has enabled your psyche and health to function. So relocation is a good thing because it's an adventure. Uh, media and technology is a fantastic thing with the gifts it's giving to us. It's in the combination, the fission of the two that has become an obstacle for us to create and recreate the, the social support system that is critical to being able to cope with change. And so when you're talking about letting life change you, another myth of pop psychology, you don't change from the inside out. You change from the outside in. We adapt to our circumstances. If all of a sudden we were all walked out of here and put on a gigantic jumbo jet and parachuted in to someplace in Central America or China or whatever and told, you can never leave for the rest of your life. Well, you'd be weeping. Some of you would be going, this is great. <laughs> but all of, you, all of you would have to sort of adapt. And what would happen to you over, the, over time? You'd, like, you'd become a family with the same collection of wonderful people and idiots, which is like your family and my family, just like your coworkers the complicated personalities that you have to cope with. Scott Peck, M. Scott Peck, who wrote a wonderful book that still holds up uh, on psychology, The Road Less Traveled, talks about that. He said those relationships like that, not just the intensity of the significant relationship, help rub the edges off you and cause you to be humble and to change. Change is really hard. I've worked in the area of addictions for a long time, and if you think about it, a lot of the institutions that facilitated the capacity to lose ourselves into uh, um, are gone. I mean, a lot of what you do, these conferences are amazing because if you come to them year after year, you get to see your distant cousins who are in the same field and it energizes you and it's fun. You go to the conferences, you're energized by the content and you get the meals are fun. I mean, it's a blast and it's a little peek into the feeling, the sensation, the mood change that is supposed to be part of your daily life. We used to have more people, you know, people don't go to church very much anymore. You know, it's really, church attendance is crashing. It's like under 20%. Uh, but in fact, those places, um, working a lot with uh, support groups, hey, hey, think about this. You know, the new research on uh, willpower, <laughs> on uh, temptation and willpower, is pretty discouraging. Willpower... Uh, is actually what, uh, in academic terms, is called a depleting resource. Right? In other words, you have the answer, I want to quit this habit, and so you, you can do it the first time. You have less actual brain energy to do it the second time. The best uh, example was smoking for me. I grew, up, I grew up in a household that smoked. It was like, in the, it was like everyone smoked. I mean, parents smoked. With seven kids in the house, it was like the house was filled with smoke. I mean, I didn't even know we had color TV for two years. When I was in the Army, it was like, smoke them if you got them. They even gave you the little packets to keep your cigarettes. This is the Army, you know, to go out there and fight healthy, you know, have a cigarette. Yeah, I'm ready to fight. <laughs> Will there be running involved? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not into the running. Can I get into a tank or a truck or something like that? And so uh, when I decided to quit smoking, well, if you smoke a pack a day, think about it, it's a good habit to get your, get your head around with this. If you smoke a pack a day, say you're smoking like a cigarette every hour. And so at nine o'clock you say, I'm gonna quit smoking. You get up at nine o'clock, I'm gonna quit. And so you don't have that nine o'clock one. Victory, 10 o'clock. <laughs> yes, 11 o'clock. <sighs> 12 o'clock, <sighs> fail, right? And so you, Beat yourself up that it was a moral failure or an act, a willpower failure. Well, yeah, it's a brain failure, folks. You can't do it. You can't do that stuff alone. That's the premise of AA, for example. Bill Wilson realized that stopping drinking, for example, necessitated the support of others who can empathize with you. Empathy. 
That's what it's about. This is an empathic group. You know among yourselves, as different as your states are, your institutions are, your circumstances are, your particular roles are, it's an empathic group. You know each other's stuff. You know what you're running into. How many, how many times does someone here at a dinner or a conference in a sharing thing go, well, this is what I run into, and everyone goes, never heard of that. No, you've all heard of that. You've all heard of that. It's an empathic group, and you buttress each other. And so, you know, when we talk about family, that's so overused, and community so soft. But the fact of the matter is, it's refrigerator rights. You have to march into relationships where you repopulate your life to have those kind of relationships. Uh, and I don't know how you do it, but you don't do it by bonding, this notion of, shall we bond? Let's look into each other's eyes and we'll bond. I've never spent five minutes bonding with my brothers. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> you got close shoulder to shoulder. It's the wrong metaphor. It's not face to face, it's shoulder to shoulder. You are closer emotionally to the people who you see, that crowd I said, more than you think. Even if at the same time you think, oh yeah, she drives me nuts. Eh, she's still in your life. She's our nut. Right? Uh, this is what's unique and distinct about the American zitgeist, the American cultural norms today. Between moving and technology, we have become privatized and isolated emotionally. Even if you're peppered with relationships, you may have 500 Facebook friends and encounters all the time, but how close are they? Not very close. It's why, for example, in the Latino community, with all of the big buzz about you know, immigration and stuff, the Latino culture, uh, even the European culture, certainly the Asian culture, uh, one of my grad assistants was from India, and uh, it was, she's a right, I love this, Rohini, and uh, she was raised in India, and her parents took jobs as engineers in uh, Wisconsin. And so uh, she came in, she went to high school in the US and then came to Purdue. And so she's really a cool resource to me. We adore her like a daughter because she was thoroughly uh, knowledgeable about her Indian heritage and Indian culture and yet thoroughly Americanized. And so, um, so uh, matter of fact, she, uh, her parents retired from um, being engineers and took jobs in semi-retirement as blackjack dealers at the Native American casino. And Deepak, her dad, made me laugh because he said, you know, Dr. Will, we are the only actual Indians <laughs> at the Indian casino. And I got schooled on clan and kin and connection and loyalty in ways that make our teens bristle. So I don't know how you do it. So when I said at the beginning, this is for you and for your clients, Start looking at your own life and the lives of others around you, even if quietly. Put your clinician's hat on. Put your shrink hat on. And to look at it through the lens of the social network that they have or don't have. How isolated. How attached and glommed on to only their spouse and their kids, this little atomized world that they live in. Who else do they got in their life? So when you think about extending knowledge and lifestyle, out into the community. I hope you'll kind of give a consideration for extending this kind of a message out, that any activity that gets you together and creates more collective uh, has amazing benefits uh, going forward. Because I, th I really think this is what ails us, I really do. That's my niece, isn't she sweet? Want a refrigerator rent, I already told you that, okay. Blah, 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 okay. Questions, rude comments, snide remarks. Uh, I'm trying to get healthy. I've, I've been getting healthy. Uh, like uh, Sally and I, uh, we downsized. And uh, in our backyard, we decided to have like a garden, like an English garden, so I wouldn't have to mow. But it's been very healthy. And so you know what we did? We made a big mistake. I hope we don't offend anyone. We began feeding the birds. OK, it's all right. I mean, it's a good thing. Hey, I'm evolved by feeding the birds. I was spending like 200 bucks a week on bird food. I mean, it's like, shouldn't they be finding this on their own? Isn't that sort of how they're designed? <laughs> I have like five pound chickadees in my backyard. <laughs> they don't even fly anymore. They just like come and peck at the window. I didn't know birds could belch. It's amazing. <laughs> so anyway, um, how are we doing on time? We okay? Good? Yep, good. Thank you, folks. I hope it was helpful. Refrigerator rights, get them. <laughs>